Donald, thank yeah. you for yeah. joining us on the Spirit Farm podcast, man. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me, Caleb. Good to see you, buddy. It is great yeah. to see you. It's great to yeah. see you again. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been a while since we played volleyball in the North Gym. <laughs> <laughs> wow wow that's that's a while right 20 plus years like right? 20 Almost. yeah 20 21 years crazy right? oh Where'd man time go? It, it is goodness. it is really crazy yeah. uh, i want to talk about i want to talk about your whole journey i want to talk about uh coming to america from albania and then in f- volleyball being your passion and doing so mm-hmm. well at usc when you and i were together and then, and then you continue to go on as a pro volleyball player and then playing in the Olympics and all that kind of stuff. We'll get yeah. to that. And then transitioning to post pro athlete and kind of making your way in the business world. But mm-hmm. first, can we, can we hit on just, man, that, that <laughs> unique journey from Albania? Like what, <laughs> what was it like? It was when you left Albania, it was like civil unrest, right? It was chaos. I call that part chaosism. You know, you go from communism to, I don't know if there's a word about chaosism, right? Like it's, uh, it was crazy, man. People getting killed and people robbing. There's no rule of law. There's no police. And people were just leaving the country by boat, walking. I mean, I did the same thing. I walked over the mountain to Greece. There was no police at the time? They left. Everybody left. Oh, there was my no gosh. Rule of law. And it was just people were just shooting each other. I mean... Albania had the largest AK-47 depot in the world. I don't know why, because we were training every Sunday to protect ourselves from Americans. Well, I realized that Albania was 3 million people like Orange County. And when I came to America, I'm like, oh, wait a second. The math doesn't add up, right? <laughs> so, but we had like about 50 million guns, right? So when everything opened up, man, it became gangs. And, you know, Caleb, sadly speaking, during chaos season, because you'd appreciate, I mean, well, you would not appreciate this, but you understand it. During communism, we had no churches, right? Uh, we knew about that because our grandparents talked a little bit about it, you know, but we had no no religion, no church, no mosque, nothing. Huh. And then once the communism fell off in 91, then all of a sudden, like my best friends who I grew up became Muslims and became Orthodox and became Christian and became these gangs. Huh. And that's when the biggest fight happened between these kind of Muslim gangs, Orthodox gangs, and it was crazy to see. I mean, one of my good friends died, you know, like one of my good friends got shot and stabbed just having coffee, you know, and I'm just because of religion, you know, and it, to me, that was a sad part to see. Um, yeah, absolutely, man. So, yeah, so it was crazy, right? how old were you when it was the chaos time in well, Albania? I, I was, uh, was it, 91, yes, yeah, so I was uh, 14. 14. 14. And 14 at the time, when it started, yeah. Mm-hmm. And at the time, your your father was like the the volleyball like national yeah. coach, right? Yeah, national team coach, and then he was also coaching the professional team in our city. So he basically took me out of high school and said, "You're gonna play volleyball, right?" I mean, when I played soccer and everything else, but then I grew tall, and he said, "Hey, you're gonna play volleyball." I decide that for you, I'm all right? <laughs> so, I was, so I was going to night school, high school, and I'll play volleyball all day, and then you know, had a knife behind me just to come when I come home after school, you know, because it was, it was, uh, you don't know who's coming. Yeah. So and you had no, a knife in your pocket. Yeah. There's no lights. I mean, there's no like lights like here in Orange County, right. To walk around when it's dark, it's dark yeah. <laughs> and you have to walk back home and you don't know who's behind you. Right. So it's, it's crazy, man. At age 14, you know, you don't wish to, you know, it's like, you know, to happen to other people, but I don't know, man, human spirit is strong, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, what, what do you think that that time, of living there, of enduring that, of seeing that, of of kind of living through that fear. What did that create in you? Do you think? Do you feel like that has helped you in your yeah. life? Yeah, I was. You know, that's a great question because I feel like we all learn by experience, right, Caleb? Like, and if you don't have experience, I mean, I can talk to you a thousand times, you know, but you never get it, right? So right. for me, that experience of communism, first of all, like you know, the kind of like shutdown mentality, one way of thinking, yeah you know, no future, one piece of bread a day, right? Yeah. To chaos, you know, to this, like, just people start killing each other and trying to survive. What it taught me is, like, I was able to sustain pain. Huh. You know, I was able to sacrifice a lot, huh. right? So, and you know, I it was like the sacrifice and be able to suffer. You know, I was able to, to really push myself to the limit mentally and physically, huh. right? So that ability to sustain, and it was... Once you sustain a little bit of pain and a little bit of sacrifice, then it's the next thing. And so, like your 
threshold of sustainability of pain per se, right? Physically yeah. or mentally becomes bigger. Yeah. So to me, going through those play and you know, not getting killed, actually not getting shot, so yeah. thank God. But right. surviving those times, right, was really I saw the world as a candy store after that. I'm mm. like, hmm, cool. I mean, yeah, whatever. COVID-19, I'm like, well, this is funny. <laughs> 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 so, but I think like, you know, like, and, and that's, I think, Caleb, that was my uh, formula to success, you know, like it was like the ability to sustain uh, suffering and yeah. sacrifice yeah. at a high level, which then, you know, created success for me later yeah. in life. You know? Yeah. You know, I've heard you, Donald, I've heard you say you were on Tom Ballou's Impact Theory uh, mm-hmm. podcast, and I, he- I heard you tell him that you thought that that was the, the secret to success was, yep. you called it the three S's, yep. sacrifice, suffering, leads mm-hmm. to success. Uh, I believe that 100%. So you, you lived that. I mean, you lived that as a kid, and mm-hmm. then... You and then how did you get to the U.S.? What was that transition? <laughs> so that's a crazy story to itself because I had no idea that my grandmother was born in Philadelphia in 1921. Oh wow! So yeah, in, back in the 30s, Albania used to be a kingdom, a king- right? It was a beautiful kingdom and uh-huh. it was very you know thriving country. Uh-huh. So I guess we had cousins in Albania. So my grandmother came in and they bought land, they bought a bunch of stuff. Wow. And then in the 40s, the, you know, the wars happened. So my grandma and her cousins said, like, you know what, we're going to get out of here, sell everything, and then go back to America. Well, we got unlucky with the crazy guy that shut down the country. And then they put my grandma to jail, my grandpa, for, you know, five years. They took wow. our money. And then she never saw her family for 40, for 50 years. Wow. Yeah. So we... We had an idea that because we're kind of so-called persecuted family in Albania, yeah. which is stupid, you know, communism mentality. We are spies. I don't know what, because we had no TV. <laughs> we had no no phone, nothing, right? But we were persecuted the whole time in communism, my parents, you know, everything. But and then when in 89, when the communism starts slowly eroding, right, like Eastern Germany and Eastern Europe, then my grandma, out of the blue, gets his passport and said like, hey, we're going to America. And I thought she was joking. <laughs> I, thought she was, <laughs> I thought she was lying, right? Because <clears throat> it wasn't even a dream. Like, I, I mean, you're lucky you grew up in America, but when you were born in communism, you have no dreams. No dreams. Because there's, not, there's nothing to reach for. Yeah. There's no, it, it just, you don't tell even, you what to do. You don't even know that there is something to reach for, right? You just. They tell, yeah, they tell you what to do. They tell you what school to go to. They tell you where you're going to live. That, I mean, thank God they don't tell you what to marry, but I mean, pretty close. They tell you how much money you're going to make for the next 40 years. They tell you what to listen. I mean, it's everything programmed, right? Wow. So to me, when my grandma said, we're going to America, I thought she was a high or she's going to get us killed <laughs> because. You know, if you have an American passport in Albania in the midst of chaosism, people will kill you. Wow. So, you know, long story short, she walked to the U.S. Embassy in 1990 and she said, I'm an American citizen. I want to go home. And wow. they took her within two months. They sent her to Boston and then she applied for family unification. So we had to wait five years legally. We're not illegal immigrants. <laughs> but I had to wait five years, you know, to do all the testing and the process, you know. So 95, 94, wow. 95, uh, we were shipped to Boston. I said, hey, you're going to Boston. I said, oh, where's Boston? I have no idea. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that's how my coming to U.S. was then, yeah. And that whole time from 1990 to 1995, were you thinking – I, th- I think I'm going to go to the U.S. soon. I think I'm It was go- so far of a reach, Caleb, that I didn't believe it, you know, because it's, it's, it's I don't know how to explain, man. It's, it didn't even enter my brain, yeah. right? I mean, people were going to Greece, Italy. So personally, would you like this story? I, I actually walked to Greece in 94. You did. Because we're not getting a visa for America. And I'm like, you know what? This doesn't make sense. I'm just going to Greece. So me and my buddies walked for like 15 hours and they're about to get us, you know, we... They're shooting at us. I mean, it's just like, you know, it is crazy. Right? But I walked there to try out for a volleyball team. And this story will come in with the Olympics after that. I, I tried out for a volleyball team in Greece, walked for 16 hours over the mountain with friends and Greek soldiers trying to kill us. And then we got there, we get a bus, we go to one of our friends' house. I tried out for volleyball. They cut us. They sent us back home, you know. So it was like a four, <laughs> it was like a five day. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was crazy. That is insane. That's the yeah, most dramatic tryout I've ever heard of. It's but ninety four. Remember this because two thousand four. You know the story was coming out after, right? So ninety four. Then I come back from Greece. I am. I mean, I'm like what sixteen, right? I'm like, 
I'm destroyed. I'm like, I got no future, no money. We are poor. I mean, it's like people are getting killed. I don't know what we're going to do, right? And then, thank God, like, the embassy called. It's like, oh, your visa got, you know, approved. So we had to, like, uh, just rush to the embassy. My brother got stuck for six years because he just turned 21 because of the time passed, you know? So he got stuck alone there worse you know uh, but we you know we came we packed up and we came to boston in 94 it was uh 94 95 was a J- um, february in the middle of the snow it was like snow like bigger than usc buildings crazy gnarly <laughs> just <laughs> stop in boston and said welcome to america welcome said, to america yeah. Um, so there, during that time, are you, you're playing volleyball that whole time till 1995? W- yeah. And then, you know, like we were playing volleyball, but that was the only sane thing to do, you know, only but sane, we were so, yeah. we had such a great system pre-communism and then during chaos season became, you know, just survival mode, you know, we're training, playing, there was no, I mean, it was just a mess, you know, but that was my passion from young, you yeah. know, like strangely speaking, since I was little, I had this mindset, my dad, I think. He manipulated me at a young age. He'd get me up in the morning and make me run. You know, we live near the mountains and hills and said, run that, you know, because when you go to practice in a flat field, you know, you're going to be like a beast, right? So yeah. to me as a young kid at age nine, I'm like, huh, oh, man. And it works, right? You run these hills in the morning and afternoon, you go to the flat field of soccer or volleyball and you kind of feel like a beast, right? You're like, oh man, I can, I can jump higher. I can run faster. But that kind of created this kind of like a um, confidence, right? To me that I'm like, oh, I'm better than this 11-year-old kids. Or then I start running more. So in my mind, I just want to be like the best athlete in the world. But my world was, I don't yeah. know, 50,000 people, you know? So, Dude, yeah, well, crazy. I, I, it paid off because you remember – uh, after practice, we'd have to go down to the track and, right? and yeah. run laps or run sprints. And <laughs> I, 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 I was faster than everyone else on the team, and you yeah, beat you me were. by two lengths. You were, you, were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you, were, you were another level of athleticism over all of us. Yeah, it started young, my friend. It started young. Yeah, it started young, and it started, you know, because of that kind of manipulation my dad put in my brain, you know, so – yeah. Now, then, do you did you yeah. have any resentment towards your dad later? Or I did- hated my I hated my dad when I was <laughs> for three years. I, I wouldn't go home because he would wake me up at like five thirty in the morning, and then just in communism, get up and go. And then in practice, uh, he'd keep me after practice for another hour, you know, against my will. <laughs> and I wouldn't go home till he slept or till he was out with his friends, you know. So I didn't like him much at a young age. But then I I, I thank him every day once I got to USC. Huh. man it's a, because even so when i got to boston i started working right because there's no volleyball there i don't know anybody so i'm doing two jobs i'm selling donkey donuts all day and i'm working at the hospital wow. washing dishes and then because we had no gym or no car so my dad would still take me out in the snow we'd go to the track and field and we'd just do sprints and wow. because we had nothing else to do for a year you know so he still pushed me during those times yeah and then how did you break through to a volleyball tryout or getting to mm-hmm. USC? So that's one thing I love about America. And I'm a true patriot. I love America because here uh, people see your hard work and people are willing to help. Mm. So, you know, uh, funny enough, I went to my local church and I said to the priest, I'm like, God, wherever you are, priest, wherever you are, mm. help me because I'm lost. I don't like America. I'm one year here. I'm working like 23 hours a day. I have no friends. I, I'm a young kid. I'm 17, 18, you know, like, so what do I do? And then those two things he told me changed my life. He said, well, you, how's your English? Right? And my English was 10%. You remember still in college, my English was bad. But um, he said, well, son, it's like, if you don't know English, you can't understand Americans. Because hmm. I had this like friction between Americans and me. Like, you know, it's kind of like they're too cold. They don't, you know, they're too loud. You know, they don't invite me to parties or they don't hmm. invite me, you know, but but I didn't understand them because I understand the culture and the mindset of American lifestyle, you yeah. know? So, and I invested time and, you know, and um, stuff in that. And then I went to my local high school and I walked into the coach. I said, Hey, I want to play. I, can I, tr- can I t- please play volleyball? Because a couple of kids would come to Dunkin' Donuts and buy donuts, right? And they had a volleyball shirt. Okay. And I said, like, Hey, wh- where do you guys play? And it's like, Oh, this high school here. I'm like, can I come and train? And they're like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, just, man, can I just come and touch the ball? I, and it's been a year. I, I, I freaking miss it, right? 
So they opened the door for me, you know, wow. and I went to the local high school and the guy was like, so who are you? <laughs> it's like, you know, because East Coast, I got lucky. East Coast sucks volleyball. I mean, right. Like, it's terrible. There's not much going it's, on. It's terrible. So I got in the gym and I'm like, finally, I saw a gym after a year of Dunkin' Donuts. I'm like, <laughs> holy moly, this is a beautiful high school gym, you know, like just heat it up, you know, and I'm like. So the high school coach like, man, he's like, have you thought about going to college in America? I'm like, no, I want to play pro. And he said, there's no professional league in America. I'm like, what? Like America doesn't have a professional league? So I was shocked that the yeah. U.S. does not have a professional league. So yeah. he talked to my cousin, my cousin who lived in Cambridge. Um, it's, a, it's a crazy story. He, in Cambridge, my cousin knew the, the coach of Harvard University. Huh. So this guy, Turkish, he had a beautiful cheese and sweet shop. He's still there, actually, Iksan. And my cousin went to him like, hey, son, I have this kid from Albania. And he's like, Albania? He's like, I'm Turkish. I know the volleyball world. So he huh. got me in uh, to meet the coach. And then the coach like, yeah, come on, come on, try out and see who you are. You know? So I show up at Harvard University in Caleb. And I look around and I'm like, this is when I start dreaming about America <laughs> that moment at Harvard. I'm like, this is a school? Like, what? You know, it's beautiful. That's right? so I got in the gym. Yeah, I got in the gym there and I started trying out for the team for a couple of months. And I, that's when I fell in love. I stopped working. And then the coach asked me for my grades. And that was the end of conversation because I still hadn't finished high school in Albania, right? It's nighttime. So my dad, uh, we uh, sent money to one of my best friends. We paid for our my high school license. <laughs> they, <laughs> they ship it to me. I show it to the coach and he's like, nah, man, it doesn't work like this in America. Sorry, but I'll help you, you know? So him and my cousin start calling every coach in America, you know, and everybody said no. And then one coach, Jim McLaughlin at USC said like, oh yeah, I'll come down and check him out. So he flew to Boston uh, for a weekend, saw me play. And then a week later, he offered me a full ride, which by the way, I had no idea what it meant a letter of intent. I'm like, what does this mean? Till the priest starts crying. True story is like, like USC offered you a full ride. I'm like, hey man, what does that mean? He's like, they're going to pay you for your school. I'm like, great. They're going to give you money. No idiot. They're going to pay you for the school. Like school costs in America? Because it's free in Europe, right? Schools. So I'm like, for me, I, I didn't care. <laughs> and yeah, man, that was a, uh, that's how it happened for Donald, the scholarship. What an what an incredible story! Not just coming from chaos in Albania, <laughs> but then you land in Boston. You're at Dunkin' Donuts, which is I you, love it. I love Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts is amazing. It's like it's like it's what Boston is known for: the Celtics, yeah. Dunkin' Donuts, yep. <laughs> and Harvard, right? And uh, and and there you are serving donuts, and then you find yourself connected through a couple of kids or whomever to you're yeah. at Harvard, uh, and then I, I I love the part where McLaughlin comes out, gives you a full ride. And your next conversation is with the priest. And that guy, he must have seen God's just kind of like as a blessing on you. Like how, a, how he, did this how did this happen? He threw a party. Like the priest like had a Sunday service and at night he threw a party. And we we're like full of Albanians. And like, oh my gosh. You know, it was like the biggest party. I'm like, why are these people so happy? Like when I'm going to school, you know? So <laughs> I was shocked, you know, at the love. But, you know, that's, that was a big lesson of America for me, man. Like, you know, and the people are willing to help you here if you reach out for help and if you show them, you know, your real intentions, you know, like there's, it's, it's incredible country because the world is not the same, right? It, it's, um, the world does not do the same thing when you yeah. ask for help. Yeah. Nobody helps you. So, mm. you know, and, and then Jim, you know, then Jim left and then Pat Powers came and then calls me about to cancel my scholarship. He's like, who are you? Why do you have a, why do you have a full ride at USC? I don't know you. <laughs> So that was another crazy story. I had to fail SATs three times. I almost, I showed up in January. You did? I missed the, yeah, I missed the preseason because I couldn't pass the SATs. I mean, oh. English was so hard. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea, you know. So I stopped working. I stopped training for six months. And then I dove into, you know, again, the local high school, the local coach, the local teacher, the local priest, you know. So everybody chipped in. You know, everybody chipped in English to support math. you. And it was amazing, man, you know. And I... I passed the test. I shot January January second at at SC North Gym. <laughs> Incredible, crazy. Well, I mean, it's it's living proof of your shirt there, right? People over everything. It's yeah. the it's the people in your life that made the biggest that made the difference. 
but in America though, man, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. America. Yeah. yeah, God bless America, honestly. So you get to USC January second. You missed the whole preseason. Uh, people listening aren't going to understand Pat Powers, but you and I understand <laughs> Pat Powers, and he is he was not an easy person to play no. for, uh, no. and that and that's what you're showing up into. Um, yeah. And so, what was that like? You get to USC. I mean, you've seen Harvard, so you know kind of the beauty of the, mm. the campus. That's that's something. But then you got these privileged white boys <laughs> uh, and, a, and a big 6'6", angry coach. What, <laughs> what were you thinking? Uh, when I got to the gym, man, I was trying to size up who, who the setter was. You know, I, I became competitive my first morning. I show up in the gym. <laughs> and I'm trying, like, everybody's tall, 6'8", blonde, blue right. eyes. I'm like, dang it. Right. I want to suck here. You know, this kind of, by then, I knew now, like, I'm at California, the best in volleyball. I'm like, holy crap. I'm this skinny kid. So I go in the gym, and I size up the kids, and the power starts, you know, yelling at everybody. Like, I mean, our coach was uh, not, uh, not a very friendly person. No. And then he always started the practice with sprints, you know, like warm up and sprints, you know. So, and that played in my in my you know strength. It's weird, right? Like my first kind of entrance to USC was doing sprints at the North Gym, and I mean, you can imagine me. I'm like, uh, there's no way anybody can beat me. Like I just no. left Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> oh, by the way, I was sprinting up and down the mountains in chaosism. So. so, then Power saw that, and he started, you know, the warm up setting, and I just, you know, when he said like, hey. We papered and they said, okay, setters, you know, uh, you know, uh, set the ball, to, you know, for the hitters. And I just, man, I went right away. I didn't, I, I didn't even care who the setter was. So I just, and then, you know, there's a couple of setters that are like, all right, you guys are going to rotate. But I, I just jumped into that opportunity, whatever mm -hmm. that first 30 minutes. And my dad always told me like, hey, make that good first impression, whatever you do, just right off the bat, you know, like practice or teacher or some what do you meet, you know, like good first impression is important. Yeah. Of course, you have to maintain it, right? So for me, those first 30 minutes, I was like a, a hungry or angry lion, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want to outrun these guys. I want to outset. I don't care who it is, you know? Yeah. And then we finished practice and I'm like, huh, okay, well, I got a future here, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you were, you ended up being the starting setter, your freshman, right, right out of the gate. Like, yeah, unfortunately, like the other won. setter didn't like me much. Yeah, so uh, he got angry with at me with me. I'm like, well, wh why is that my fault? You know, <laughs> just like, he was a senior. Yeah, so you know. Yeah. Yeah, but what can you do, right? Well, and competition. competition, competition, man. Right. I mean, part, yeah. It's part of the deal. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then um, I I came the next year and got to play with you. You made me better at volleyball. Just peppering mm -hmm. every day with you. Mm -hmm. um, made me like this much better at, at volleyball. I, I, I remember that man, just those like 10 minutes, uh, at the beginning of practice every right. day, you, you, you play at such a high level and with so much intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, th that was fun. I, I felt like you, yeah. you and I, our version of pepper at the net was, <laughs> was at a different level than what <laughs> everybody else was doing over here. <laughs> Uh, but that was mostly because of yeah. you. You were so you were so hungry and yeah and uh, yeah. That was those were fun times, dude. That was good, man. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. And then so USC for you. Uh, did you know that you wanted to go and play pro after that? What was that? What was that transition like from USC to pro volleyball? So you know that was my. Uh, I mean that was my kind of outcome of my life. Right? As soon as USC was just a you know a platform of. You know, finishing the school, I was really like first year. I had no idea where I was, but like after that, I realized that I had to keep my grades up, and you know, so I focused on getting the grades and finishing the school. I took summer school, you know, like I really committed to the study and and the sport, right? Both of them, because I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be that kid who was the best in the world, you know. But my world back in Albania was ten, 10 thousand people in my city. And then all of a sudden, you know, I see UCLA, I see these guys, you know, I'm like, all right, well, it's, I have to put more work because some guys are better than me, right? I realize where I am now. So, mm. uh, you know, that was my plan, you know, to go play professionally till I, uh, I talked to our uh, lovely coach, Pat Powers. And I don't know if you know this, but his advice was two things. He's like, join the army at 2000. I mean, given that I just finished as a two-time All-American Player of the Year at USC, his advice to me was to join the Army or learn how to sell cars. What? 
yeah, 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 exactly your face, exactly my face. I'm like, Pat, you are a gold medalist uh, legend in Europe. Can you help me get a contract in Europe? It's like, ah, oh, you know, like you're a strong kid. You should join the army. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> True story, man. Like, you know, you go to his office. He's like, yeah, join the army. Yeah. What? That That's insane, dude. That yeah, insane. you were a two-time yeah, so... All-American, four-year starter. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you're European. I mean, right. like, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that's, that's incredible. But, you know, I was committed to the sport, you know, so... Um, uh, as I was, I was trying to figure out to go to Europe, I couldn't get a contract because, you know, like back then it was very difficult and no, no, no video, nothing. And I didn't know any agents, nothing. Right. So one of my friends told me like, Hey, why don't you go to USA team? I'm like, like us Olympic team. And it's like, yeah, bro, like you're pretty good. I'm like, <laughs> well, I, I'm like, I don't know, man. That's that, that, that's us Olympic team. By now I've kind of surpassed my thought process, my brain, right, you know, right. got, got enlarged, but I'm like, that's. I that's mean, another like, level. Know, that's, I mean, that's, you know, the top of the world. I mean, U.S. team is the best in the world. So it's like, try it out. So, uh, you know, I, again, I reach out to Doug Bill through a friend and I say, hey, Doug, I'm Donald. You know, he's like, oh, I know who you are. He's like, look, man, can I try out? It was May, uh, June 2000, you know, and he said like, uh, why? Because <laughs> he, he knew I was Albanian. He's like, you're from Albania? I'm like, no, but I'll become American in 2004. And, and he's like, Oh, but that's four years from now. So come back in 2004. I'm like, what am I gonna do? what am I gonna do for four years? I'm like, I don't know. Like you know. So he said, well, if you speed up the process of your passport, then you can come and try out after the Olympics in Atlanta, right? So I go around USC and I'm like, kind of like, what to do? What to do? And my body said, like, man, you went to USC, bro. That's like the largest network in the world. So go to the AD. So I show up at Mike Mike Garrett's office and I say, Mike, I need help. And they said, what do you need? And they said, like, look. I have to wait four years. There's 10,000 people in front of me. I'm going to become an American regardless. But if I become in four years, I miss an opportunity to try out for US team. Can you help me? So the next day, I shot at his office. He's on a live call with Diane Feinstein. She knows my name. She knows who I am. She knows my everything about me. And Caleb, incredible story, man. I was June. Uh, by August, I got my passport. <laughs> <laughs> True. I, I, unbelievable i went to the immigration office in downtown la in august top floor and the head of immigration there had a huge usc picture there i'm like hmm, that's, that's kind of weird but whatever you know so I, I was kind of afraid i'm like what i do wrong you know so we're talking like me and you and he said hey son welcome to america make us proud this is a direct request from the top and you know special whatever they have these occasions you know he said good luck with usa team Wow, that Donald, that that's it. incredible, dude. I, I cried. I cried. I, I, I cried there, yeah. I would have too, yeah. man. The your, your coach wasn't much help. Uh, but <laughs> but the athletic director, Mike Garrett, who's, you know, uh, a USC Hall of Fame and yep. you know, NFL player, uh, calls Diane Feinstein on your yeah. behalf and yes, you sir, yeah. and you get She's your soft. passport two months later. That's incredible. I was blessed, man. I, you know, that hand of, I think, priest, you know, that in yeah. Boston, I think, kept me going, you know, because <laughs> it's not blessing there, man, because I don't know. I've, you got some my divine. life has been about one opportunity, you know, so, yeah. and I've taken it, you know. So. Well, there's something, too, about, about people that work really hard. You were the hardest working guy on the team. I would like mm -hmm. to think that I was almost there with you, but you, you, you were as well. You, you were as well. Yeah. yeah. You just had that, you, you had that mm -hmm. inner drive and grit from probably how you grew up that just, it just took you to a little bit of another level. And, uh, and there's something about people that understand how to work that hard. Mm -hmm. Good opportunities tend to find those people, right? I hope that I think so. No, I see it now in America. <laughs> it's a, it's amazing, you know, but, and it's, it's, a, you know, like people ask you for mental toughness, you know, people always ask me like, Oh, what's the mental toughness of an Olympian? And I'm like, you know what, man, there's no secret sauce. It's just getting up every day and doing the same thing. I'm like, I go speak to young kids, you know, and they say like, uh, I just have this, just one thing who here can do 10 pushups. Of course, all the high school kids, uh, I can do 30. <laughs> I'm like, who can do 10 pushups every day for the next six months? Well, that's boring. I'm like, well, that's exactly, you know, going to be an Olympian, you know, that's your mindset. Mm. It, you know, all it is, Caleb, is getting up every day and doing it and repeating it and doing it and repeating it. And 
And I think because of my experience of suffering and sacrificing, I was able, you know, when you got tired and your muscles hurt, just because of your upbringing, you stop. Not because you're weak. I'm sure you're stronger and better. But just because you, you know, you stopped that because you just didn't have a backup experience, right? Yeah. So you said, hey, I did my best today. Yeah. You know, but guess what? You have, I'm sure you had so much more in your tank yeah. to do. You just stopped. And yeah. it wasn't your fault for me. I was like, man, I, I, my muscles hurt, but I've, I've seen worse muscles hurt, right? Walking 15 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, uh, I can perhaps sustain, you know, 12 reps rather than 10, right? Yeah. I'm sustained one more extra sprint or one more extra set, you yeah. know, one more extra this, you know? So for me, that was just, you know, at, you know, at those conditions at USC, I'm like, you kidding me, right? <laughs> so that's why I think that fire came, you know, cause I had a bigger tank. Yeah. Yeah. That's all, you know, and I used it and I used it for the right reasons. Right. So then, so then you, you get the passport, do you go try out? Yep. And what happened? I shop at U.S. Olympic uh, Center in Colorado Springs. It was four of us, me, Clayton Stanley, Rich Lamborn, and Riley Salmon, all gold medalists. There's four of us, and there's no team. I'm like, what's going on here? Why, why is there four of us? And I didn't, because every guy was going to Europe every winter. So I spent the whole winter in, um, in Colorado Springs. So Doug Bill offered me a, a training position, you know, to, to train and see like my skills and who I am as a person. So that was awesome. It sucked because we were training eight hours a day with four guys in Colorado Springs <laughs> and making no money. And, uh, you know, but again, you know, like I was okay with that. You know, I was yeah. living in Olympic center. Yeah. I was eating yeah. at the cafeteria. Michael Phelps used to sit next to me and I'm like, who's this weird guy? You know, like swimming all day. <laughs> Apollo. You just you know, swim all day. You know the guy Apollo, you know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the skater, yeah. speed skater? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, man, this guy's got huge legs. I should beat him. <laughs> and I go to the weight room. I'm like, holy Jesus, what sport does he play? Because, I mean, his legs were like tank. <laughs> so, but, you know, and I'm sitting there with those guys and going to the gym. And for me, that was a dream. Not yeah. even a dream, but it was like, you know, the icing on the cake. I'm yeah. like, I'm here. Yeah. I mean, like, this is incredible, you know. So I put... I mean, everything into it, you know, and then we had the first trip to Japan in 2001 in May, and that was our tryout. So Doug, Bill took the whole team, young guys, you know, to this trip. We stayed there two weeks. The first time, you know, National Anthem played, I cried again because I was, I'm sitting in front of, you know, 10,000 Japanese screaming against U.S., and here I am. I'm like, suck it. We're going to we're gonna kick your ass, right? So, um, <laughs> pardon my language, uh, and we kicked that ass, you know? But uh, it was funny because when I got there, I, I, I think my tank became 10 times bigger, my mind wow. and my, my body and my, my inner drive. You know, when I saw what it means to represent US team, yeah. I, I mean, I don't care if I was sick or, you know, you have to cut my leg not to be on the court, right? Yeah. So. I made the team that that trip. Doug Bill cut six people on the plane back home. That was crazy. And uh, yeah, so as we flew back to Japan from Japan to LA, he cut six people, and then I made the team. And then you know, um, he said, "Welcome to US team." That doesn't mean you're gonna be here, but it means you're part of a team now. So you better, you know, uh, hurry up on the on the ladder, right? So. <laughs> so then you played in the 2004 Olympics. Yep, 2004 Olympics in Greece. And then you got injured. So 2008, uh, a summer before 2008, I was in Italy playing for the best Italian team, uh, captain. We are playing in the Supercoppa, the Super Cup, you know, and I just turned around. I was, man, I was 30, the best shape of my life. And I turned around and I felt like the guy, you know, the, op the opposing blocker kicked me. You know, I thought he tripped me, so I turned. And he looks at me, he's like, I didn't do anything. And I look down and my foot is hanging. And his sharp pain just, man, like, a, and my Achilles was just cut in half, you know, out of the blue, never been injured in my life, never. No, you stayed injury free all through, all through USC. Free, and even USD until 2007, never injured, you know, just, you know, ankle, whatever, you know, but uh, that was tough. That was uh, in the midst of my peak of my career, the peak of my you know, mind and body and financially too. Like, you know, I was like kind of a top of the world, you know, yeah. the captain of the USA team, the captain yeah. of the Italian team, making a lot of money, traveling the world, 
you know, I had everything in my hand, you know, yeah. and uh, it was taken like this. Yeah. Boom. Lost all of them. Well, and it's of. the injury that ends the careers of most NBA players, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Kobe wasn't mm -hmm. the same. No. Uh, what Dominique Wilkins and now right yep. now Kevin Durant yep. is trying to come back. It's taken him a year and a half to I come know. back from that injury. You came mm -hmm. back from it. I came back from it, yeah. And I, I took it, you know, once they cut me from the national team that, that summer. Uh, not cut me, but, you know, I didn't make the, the team. But once I, once I got out of the surgery and I came back to U.S. and I asked the doctor, I'm like, hey, man, what's it going to take for me to come back? You know, I'm 32. Of course, you can imagine the doctor's face. It's like, hmm, you know, good luck, right? Many guys <laughs> like you probably will never, you know, won't play again in national team. You might be playing in Europe in a couple of years, but forget the U.S. team, you know? So to me, I was living in Huntington Beach. Once I understood what it took to get back in shape, you know, what was the, like, what was the structure? I told the doctor, like, what do I have to do to fix my leg? And he said, you got to do this, stretching, you got to, you got to do this, stretching, you got to do that, you know? And I said, okay. So, man, I went seven days a week for nine months. I think I didn't sleep. I had an elastic band next to my bed. As I was sleeping, I was just doing, like, you know, you know, toe touches and toe pulls. I mean, I went bananas. You know, I was obsessed. It was me or the leg. There's no other way. I didn't care about volleyball. I didn't care about money. I lost because 2008, there was a, the crash, you know, of real estate. And I was living oh, in Huntington yeah. Beach. Yeah. So I bought a place there on Beach and Adams and it went downhill. So everything kind of like from the top went down. And so, you, like, yeah, you, know you, you were losing not just everything. volleyball. You lost your house. I mean, I lost my contracts in Europe. I lost a place at the USA team. I, was, I remember watching Olympics 2008 and watching pretty much the guys who I trained for eight years on TV and they keep winning one game, winning one game. And I'm just like, you know, you wish for the best, but then you don't wish for the best. You know, you have this conflict of interest. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, in 2005, we made this pact as USA team. We said, we're going to win gold in China and this is what we're going to do. To win gold in China. That was our kind of mission after Greece Olympics, you know, and we did it. And I just, it was tough not to be there. You know, yeah. it was, um, yeah. yeah, it was a tough moment there. But I took it as a personal vendetta, me or the leg, you know, and came back in actually like in eight months. Eight months. I came back. I went back to uh, play in Turkey. I went back and played in Dubai. And then I called the new coach after the Olympics, Alan Knight, and I said, hey, I don't care where you put me, just give me a chance to compete. He said, if I'm old and if I'm slow, I'll walk out of the gym by myself. He said, sure. <laughs> and that's it. You know, I played four more years, <laughs> London Olympics. Yeah. I mean, as the, as the starter. Yeah, I, I of, mean, course, yeah you, of course. You, no other way, man. Sorry. No other, you were the guy. <laughs> no other way, buddy. You know, it's either go all in or don't go inside at all. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think for me, that's always been the mindset, you know, like, I'll lose, I'll get injured, I'll, you know, you know, I'll get beat by a setter or by another team, you know, but, you know, I'm going to get up the next morning, you know, and start to work again to, you know, uh, not, to not, you know, not to allow that to happen again. Suffering, sacrifice, and eventually success, success. right? Success, yeah. It's a long journey, but it works, man, yeah. So how are you applying that now, Don Donald? How are you applying that, that uh, tenacity, mm -hmm. that hard work, that suffering, yeah. What, what, is, what does that look like today in, in, this, in this world and as you're kind of making your way yeah. in business? And yeah, it, it's been difficult because, first of all, after finishing the volleyball career and getting, I have a passion for business, I have a passion for people and traveling. And, you know, I was getting my hands into the business world, learning the business world, you know. Uh, I started after my career was done in 2014 as an unpaid intern at age 39 with three kids at a Jeez. firm in Irvine. I said, hey, just hire me. I just want to learn. I, I know I show my cold calls. I want to meet people, you know, whatever it takes, right? Unpaid uh, intern at age 39. Yeah. Yeah. I think my wife can attest for that. She, was, she, she, she thought I was crazy, you know, but I said, <laughs> my resume is great, but nobody's going to hire me because I'm this like genius athlete, right? I don't have any business experience. So right. I'd rather learn it from zero, you know? Yeah. Um, so I went there and started learning and, but it's been hard transition because, you know, you know, in the church and in sports, you have a community, you have a tribe, you know, that kind of shares the same vision and mission and yeah. friendship and brotherhood or sisterhood. Yeah. And when you get in the business world, it's lonely. 
It's mm. people don't care. And you have this different, you know, people just go there like, oh, I'm working from nine to five. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm working for whatever it takes to get this done. I mm. mean, you know, and they're like, hmm, no. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so to, I, I don't know other way. Like, I don't know any other way how to attack, you know, like how to solve a problem or how to reach a goal. Like it's either you go all in smartly, not stupidly, right? right like right. then don't, don't take it at all. Right. So it's been, you know, it was going great and I built, I was able to build my own business and invest my money to this, you know, English language platform because I remember from the priest told me in 95, I said, hey, if you don't learn English, that's right. you can't understand Americans, you're never going to make it here, yeah. you know. And to me, but, you know, when I was at USC, man, like here's a funny example, at the beginning of first year when guys were like, yo, bro, see you later. I'm like, when? He's like, what? Call you later. I'm like, but when? When are you gonna call me? And be like, <laughs> I'm like, it's the phrase. I'm like, what does that mean? You know, like, so I was so far off yeah. the American culture, right? Yeah. And it created rifts, right? It was like I was this kind of uncomfortable European guy who doesn't get it, and not because people are not friendly, but just you know, it's my job to understand American culture. It's my duty because I came here. You didn't come to my country, right? Yeah. So, to me, that's always been a passion, and I built this beautiful business and. We we're teaching immigrants in Irvine English and then American culture, how to apply for jobs, how to talk to CEOs, you know, and it was going really well till, you know, here we go, another uh, setback, you know, COVID-19 wiped out everything, you know, and that's what I struggle the most is that at a team or at the church or this community place, you can always fall back, you know, and talk to people and kind of, you know, regroup. Yeah. In the business, you're done. You know, it's a pretty cutthroat yeah. life, right? A pretty cutthroat environment where, you know, if you don't, if, if if I don't bring value to you today, if I don't make money from it today, which is the good and bad about capitalism, is that you, it, it can be pretty rough, yeah. right? Like me, that you know, losing the business, losing the money, and trying to kind of navigate the you know the new world per se. Yeah. 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 But, you know, I still go back to those three S's, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I think like that. I, you know, I'm lucky that, you know, to have a beautiful family and three boys. And, you know, they have, a, you know, a shot of oxygen every day, right? And, day. Uh, you know, right now, Caleb, my mindset, aside from that, you know, Olympic spirit and USC and the three S's is like, I'm going to win every day, each huh. day. Like I stopped thinking anymore like, hey, I'm going to make millions or build this business. I'm gonna, now I'm trying to figure out like how do I win each day? Today. 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 What do I do in the morning? Do I wake up early and work out? Or some days I don't, you know? We're not perfect, you know? Like even me, I get lazy. I gain weight, you know? Like I'm not, we're not perfect people. But I think I'm trying to kind of find myself in a new world you know like how do i win each day yeah what do i do with myself first yeah. you know because it's easy to blame and shame other people right like, oh but it's his fault my fault this is partners business yeah it happens you know but today what am i gonna do today to yeah. better myself like in volleyball right you remember as a setter let's do some reps now so when you play on sunday yeah. you get better right yeah. so i'm trying to imply this new mindset of winning each day and you know, and see what happens. I think it's awesome, Donald. I think it's important too, because sometimes if we think that it's just all about the end goal, then when we get there, it's hard to enjoy that because we've we've just conditioned ourselves to only, you know, to, to live like like something out there is going to make me happy. Something out there is going to be fulfilling. But if if we figure out how to make the most of today, maximize mm -hmm. today, live in this moment, be the best that I can be today we can end up enjoying the day too, you know? I mean, <laughs> right, and, yeah. your, and your kids are probably the best reminder of that. Yeah, I know. It's amazing, man. It's amazing like when you apply that every day and remind yourself, you know, and then trying to find a new tribe, right? Like I'm trying to find, I think we athletes, right? I mean, you're an athlete and, and you know, you're in the, you know, the spirit farm and the church groups, you know, like, you know, finding that tribe that fits the mission and the vision of, you know, life professionally and also, you know, spiritually it's not easy and i'm you know kind of looking around you know like i found my ex-teammates read pretty is doing some fun workouts on the beach you yeah. know kind yeah. of a not volleyball but overall like hey let's use volleyball but also the mindset of it to connect and stay in shape yeah. and stay healthy and you know up here and you yeah. know and your bodies so you know 
it just grind away, man. Repeat, right? Every day, you're just trying to win the day and find yep. a new tribe. And uh, you know, God, thank God we live in America. That's yep. another reminder of myself, you know, because yep. if <laughs> yep. uh, somewhere in the world things could be very, very bad, right? Now. A lot more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. More, way more challenging. Yeah, you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. I know. Yeah. Uh, I, I like Reed Pretty. He he's a good guy, and I, I'm yeah. glad that you're you're doing those workouts with him. It's a cool concept. He's he's training mm -hmm. not he's not training volleyball players. He's training regular people, but mm -hmm. using sand, right? And yeah, moving yeah, your yeah. body in sand. And it, it and sand. It's also like challenging my, uh, mindful wise. You know, it's like people are so so. Um, we are so programmed as humans, I think, to be safe. Right? Anything that happens, safe. Yeah. Anything that's hard, no. Everything that's risky, no. Right? And it just. If you don't challenge yourself every day and something like you know it could be for you know these guys like we we'll do sprints on the sand and he just it's like hey do one more right like it, it's okay if you're tired just do one more yeah if the ball is over there just run for it maybe you don't get it but just try don't stop because the ball is you know the ball is 10 feet away that's right Try. that's right take a step but then that step becomes two and three and four that's and it right. kind of mentally and physically you you know, you become, you know, your tank, right? Your inner tank becomes bigger that you, can, that you can surpass any challenge after. I think that's what he's trying to do, you know, yeah. through the workouts, yeah. Donald, such great stuff, man. Such insightful yeah. things. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your journey, uh, your, your passion, your drive. I love, I love, I love those things that you talked about, the, the, the winning every day, find, find it in this moment make the most of today and expanding mm -hmm. your tank by going the distance going a little bit further pushing myself i can endure a little bit more i can yeah. endure a little bit more uh and and your journey is a unique one and i i believe <laughs> that you're still gonna see blessing you're still gonna see that well, how that priest <laughs> prayed for you long ago you're still gonna see those those benefits and those blessings coming in this next season in this next time and, I hope uh, so, man. Yeah, that's it's, you know, I believe you know. So yeah. that's you know, gotta be, gotta stay positive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we'll we'll stay in touch, dude, and I appreciate cool. you uh, doing this. Of course, man. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. It's good to chat, you know, and share some stories. And uh, anytime, man, anything I can do to help, let me know. So. Thanks, Donald.